An hour outside the city limits of Boston, Massachusetts, lies Fall River, a small town long shrouded in the dark and disturbing mystery of its most infamous resident, Lizzie Borden. What happened in the Borden house has given the town its identity for over a hundred years. The legend goes, on a quiet summer's day, more than 100 years ago, a spinster Sunday school teacher named Lizzie Borden hacked her parents to death with an axe. A century later, police in Fall River find themselves in the middle of something far more sinister. A crime spree so diabolical, some townspeople still refer to it as the devil's work. If I believe in good, then I must believe in evil. Because it exists, and uh, it happened before our very eyes here. One early October morning, police are called to a local high school. We had beepers then. We didn't have cell phones. Uh, it seems like the dark ages. But uh, my, my beeper went off at uh, 5.30 in the morning. A couple of women jogging on the track had stumbled upon the body of a young woman lying in a pool of blood under the bleachers. Every homicide is unique. Every homicide is totally different. But this stuck out as one of the most vicious that I have had ever seen. The victim is nude from the waist down. Her hands are bound with rope. She was positioned face down, looked like her hands were uh, clasped in front of her. Her body is severely beaten. Her face and head have been crushed. It's very personal to damage a face. And so more, more likely it is about that person feeling it and sort of wiping them out, erasing them as people. Detectives quickly hone in on what they believe to be the murder weapon. Blood splattered rocks nearby. We knew this was a fresh homicide. We knew that this just happened. So uh, we wanted to be sure we collected all those rocks, all that evidence. When you have a murder and they use a weapon like stones that Clearly, you're going to have evidence on them. And then they just leave them out there after everything else has been so clearly planned. Bespeaks arrogance, the kind of arrogance that says, I don't really think anyone's going to link me to this. I'm immune from this. No one can catch me. The coroner determines the woman's skull was crushed by multiple blows. There are also several stab wounds to her head but no sign of sexual assault. What it suggests overall is someone wants this person dead and they're gonna do whatever it takes to do that. A, a knife stabbing is a little cleaner than bludgeoning with a rock, but if the knife isn't working, the rock will certainly do the job. The victim is identified as 17-year-old Doreen Levesque, a troubled runaway from neighboring New Bedford she turned to prostitution after dropping out of high school. Police are shocked by the savagery of the crime. Doreen was actually a very beautiful young girl. I had taken a photo of her on the autopsy table so that we could have her identified. It was so difficult because if you were to take those two photos and put them together, you can't even, the only thing you have is hair color. Her face was that badly distorted and crushed. There are no suspects, so to drum up leads, police spend their time where Doreen spent hers. We were very dependent on the word on the street. We get the word from the bar rooms, from the uh, people who hang around the corners, who know us, who like to drop us information. After several months, police still have nothing, and the case goes cold. Then, Three months after Doreen's mutilated body is found under the bleachers, the body of another young woman surfaces in a wooded area behind a local printing plant. 
and was found by a man walking his beagle. The dog actually started to eat the body. So he kept pulling his dog from there and he saw some, some material and clothing and then realized that this discolored, frozen mass was actually a human being. The freezing winter temperatures of Massachusetts preserve the body. But the smell is still stifling. It's a distinct smell that I will never forget. I can be on the fourth floor of a building and know that there's a dead body there. But in this case, it, because it was frozen, I remember the thawing out of that body and the horrific smell. Like Doreen, the second victim is also partially nude. Her body is badly beaten, and her face is crushed. The place is loaded with stones. And she was laying on top of a huge stone, almost like an altar, when she was killed. Upon examination, the coroner finds no evidence of sexual assault. He does find small cement shards in her hair, leading authorities to believe that the weapon of choice was a concrete block. The victim is Barbara Raposa, a 19-year-old local prostitute who was reported missing three months earlier. Barbara had already been looked for. There was already word out on the street that Barbara was missing. She was last seen dining with her boyfriend. After the meal, the two headed home separately. But Barbara never arrived. Almost immediately, detectives notice interesting parallels between the two victims. Similarities would be their involvement with prostitution and their involvement with drugs. They were both involved in the streets. Once considered the textile capital of the world, Fall River became desperate and desolate with the demise of the industry. Now its streets are lined with cheap hookers. Young girls hoping a quick trick will score the cash needed for another fix. You, you could just snap your finger and they jump in the car for a quickie, 20 bucks. Yeah. They were out there. It was back-to-back -back vehicles. There was cars everywhere. We did everything to control it, but there was an incredible number of, of women that would come in from a Providence, Boston, uh, obviously New Bedford, and uh, they would work the street there. With two hookers dead, police suspect they may be dealing with a serial killer. That's something that comes across your mind. When you have one body, you're looking immediately for another. Then you'll find another body. Adding to their suspicions, both crime scenes point to ritualistic homicide. A ritualistic homicide is a homicide committed to satisfy a psychological need so that it has to be committed in a certain way, either with certain tools or a certain pattern or posing or scripting. Almost overnight, rumors erupt that the women's deaths are connected to a satanic cult that is practicing rites in the woods at Freetown State Park, just outside of town. Once that started to hit the newspapers, they said, well, you know, we got a history of it. We got the Satan witch burnings, we got Lizzie Borden. It just mushroomed. We had heard lots already about Freetown State Forest and having black masses and ritual services taking place there. I didn't give it a lot of credence, but we didn't shrug it off. Detectives are about to discover the unlikely mastermind behind these murders. But are they too late to save the next victim? We had to find out who these murderers were, and unfortunately, one homicide led to the next. Now, there was serious concern. Is there going to be another body? After finding two posed corpses, rumors mount that a satanic cult is operating in the small town of Fall River, Massachusetts. Homicides happen everywhere, but this was unique. It was different. It was different that we had all of these elements. I call it a perfect storm, you know, where you now add the element of, of Satan, good, 
in evil. Initially, police have no way to confirm these rumors. But within days of finding Barbara Raposa's body, they get a break. A man named Andre Mortez comes forward with a shocking claim. He and Barbara are both part of a core group of about 10 people in the sex industry who worship Satan. Satanism is about sexuality, it's about greed, it's about gluttony. I mean, anything that you feel driven to do is allowed because you don't have all the biblical rules and regulations laid on you. If you feel a primal instinct, act on it, act on it now, just do whatever you want to do. Police hear that the group is mostly made up of prostitutes and one of its leaders is Carl Drew, a 25-year-old local pimp. They meet in rundown apartments and deserted spots in the woods to offer their allegiance to Satan and perform sex acts. It was a sexual thing. And they all played this into the devil worship. Sylvia and his partner start to pressure the group who grudgingly agree to let them into a member's apartment. What the detectives discover is both dark and disturbing. As we evolved in the investigation and started to see artwork on walls of Satan and um, devil tattoos on individuals, it started to become more of a serious concern. On one impromptu visit, the two detectives witness a ceremony. There were several people there. It didn't last long, and it didn't last long because of our presence, but there was chanting for Satan, Hail Satan, which gave a chill in my body. I'll never forget it. I believe there were a few of them that did wholeheartedly believe that they were calling Satan, and Satan knew what they were doing. I believe that totally. Afterwards, detectives take the opportunity to casually question several members of the group about the slayings. They knew who we were, but they wanted to talk to us because they didn't want to be implicated in any homicide. They didn't want to be accessories too. Some of these people figured keeping your enemies close is better than not having them there at all. One of those questioned is Karen Marston, a local prostitute. Karen denies knowing anything about the murders. There's nothing more tight-lipped than a prostitute. She doesn't want people to know that she's talking to the police. They're also very street smart. And the street smart side of them says, a police officer has a question to ask me. I'm gonna give him information. I'm gonna help him because if I get trouble, if I get locked up, maybe that'll help me. Detectives believe Karen knows more than she is letting on. They decide to focus on establishing a relationship with her. Little by little, she opens up Karen tells police the group is controlled by Carl Drew, who calls himself the son of Satan. She takes them to a site deep in the woods where, she says, the rituals occur. She wanted to take me to this place. Carl had taken her there, where he said he had killed people and, and put people in the water, Satan's water, the green water. It was a high algae pond but she believed that that was Satan's green water. She was definitely intimidated by Satan and the devil, and that this location was the place that you would go if Carl Drew decided to harm you. You were going to go there to meet the devil. There, police find plenty of evidence to substantiate Karen's story. There was pentagrams drawn, there was makeshift altars of where there were black masses held. If you have altars in the woods, probably you're killing animals on them. The pentagram, especially if it's within a circle, is usually about standing within the protection of that symbol in order to summon forth the demon, the various demons by name, but still protect yourself in case things get out of control. Police hear rumors that Carl Drew and small groups go into the woods to get high, have sex, and worship their master. More importantly, 
Guru uses the ceremonies to control his followers. They were using that location uh, for black mass or ritualistic ceremonies in order to place fear in, in uh, individuals that they were dealing with. They were controlling the girls in the street. And by doing so, they scared the hell out of them. And they had their little seances and they had their functions done in the woods. And the, some of these girls were part of it. They witnessed it and they knew what was going to happen. Terrified, Karen tells police she believes she will be the next from the group to die. She went through the whole detail, scared to death, often cried during the time that she was with me in such fear. Satan would kill her son and kill her if she opened her mouth to the police. She was sure of that. This is when I talked about God to her, about praying, about going to church, about getting away from this. Karen's family is deeply concerned about her safety. Her grandmother would pray rosaries and pray, go to church and pray for, for Karen to get away from the people she was with. Detective Sylvia urges Karen to agree to protective custody. She refuses. I took her to St. Mary's Cathedral where she asked to go. She had some faith. In God, Karen did. I brought her to St. Mary's Cathedral Rectory. She rang the doorbell. The priest came to the door. It was a last resort. She wanted help. She wanted spiritual help. She was just running scared. She didn't know where to go. That night, Karen Marsden disappears. She was gone that night. I dropped her off. Gone. Weeks. Nothing. I knew where she was. I didn't know exactly where she was. I know she was dead. A man with strong Catholic upbringing, Alan Sylvia suddenly finds his own faith tested. We know about the devil from our faith. We don't always see him. In this case, I saw him. I could see him in these, in the, in the crimes that were committed. People who believe strongly in spiritual forces and spiritual warfare, that there are angels and demons and God and the devil uh, using us sort of as their battleground, would see a case like this um, and be probably quite frightened. Sylvia and other law enforcement believe that Drew and his Satan-worshipping sex ring are responsible for the disappearance of Karen and for the deaths of Doreen and Barbara. But with nothing linking them to the crimes, there is little they can do. Two months after Karen Marsden vanishes, a man finds her toothless skull in the woods of nearby Westport. We found bits of hair and teeth and pieces of jewelry are scattered over a, a two-mile radius where she was dragged. Her body is nowhere to be found. The body was destroyed. We have no idea where the body was. We think there was a pig farm there that maybe the body was thrown over in the wall. Now, more desperate than ever to end the killing, police lean on some of the members of the satanic cult. Afraid that if they don't help, they themselves will become suspects the members agree to let the detectives listen in on their calls. To keep them compliant, authorities give them some party supplies. We buy them beer. We bring them marijuana. Let them do their thing. As long as we're present, as long as we can find out what's going on, as long as we find out who our murderer is. Within days, police overhear an incoming call that dramatically changes their investigation and reveals the group's true ringleader. He said clearly, I killed Karen, and they'll never figure it out because I took my clothes off. The chilling confession is from a calculated, cold-blooded killer detectives never suspected. A 17-year-old girl.
Police in Fall River, Massachusetts suspect a devil-worshipping prostitution ring is at the center of three grisly murders. They are stunned to hear that the mastermind of the cult is not the town pimp Carl Drew, but a 17-year-old girl named Robin Murphy. If there's ever any definition of evil, it's Robin Murphy. You can see evil just by looking at her. Murphy's been involved in the city sex industry since her early teens. She no longer works the streets. She controls them. Robin was the greatest intimidator that I had ever met, and the most vicious. Robin was feared more than anyone I have ever met throughout my police background by the people that she was involved with. They feared her. The, the Satan was just an add-on, just gave her ultimate control. After a six-month investigation, authorities finally get a break. They overhear a damning phone call, one in which Robin Murphy actually confesses to another cult member that she killed Karen Marsden in cold blood. She goes on to boldly state that no one would ever figure it out because she took her clothes off so there would be no evidence tying her to the scene. Police arrest Murphy and Carl Drew. They learn that the two ran the group together using the fear of Satan to control their minions. Robin could control people. Carl Drew could control people. Carl Drew controlled people because they thought that he was the son of Satan. And Satan told him to do it. And if you didn't do it, you were going to be taken care of. You were going to be punished. They used hatred and violence to intimidate and control people. Evil played an active role in those homicides and deaths of those people. The murders were part of a plan to rule the streets. Investigators think Doreen Levesque was killed because she was an outsider infringing on their territory. Robin and Carl did everything to stop her from working the street. They weren't making money when a freelancer would come from New Bedford, as Doreen did, and work the street. She was warned not to come. It's believed Barbara Raposa was killed because she knew too much about Robin's involvement in Doreen's murder and wouldn't remain silent for long. Robin would have wiped out anyone who got in the way or anyone who talked about her or anyone who talked to the police about um, her involvement. Law enforcement believe Karen Marsden witnessed Doreen's murder and was considered by Robin to be a weak link. This sealed her fate. Karen was the one who cracked. Karen is the one who couldn't take the daily pressure of life as a result of what she saw that day. Authorities have little doubt the killings would have continued had Murphy and Drew not been caught. I spoke to him at, in prison, and I looked him right in the eye, and I said, did you kill Karen Marsden? And he looked right back at me as cold as ice, and he said, no. <laughs> and you could tell, I mean, you couldn't believe this guy. You, you know that he was a liar. And I, I, I'm convinced that he was with Robin Murphy when they killed Doreen Levesque. And I'm convinced that Robin Murphy was there when Barbara Raposa was murdered. Robin Murphy agreed to plead guilty to second-degree murder in the death of Karen Marsden. In exchange, she would receive immunity in other cases and testify against Carl Drew. Murphy tells investigators that Drew ordered Karen killed. It was only hours after Detective Sylvia dropped her off at St. Mary's Cathedral that she died. Did she know she was going to be murdered that night? She had an ice cold skin. She was in total fear of Robin and Satan. Total, her, her complete body was consumed with fear. They raped her, they beat her. Carl Drew got behind Karen Mars and pulled her by the hair over his knee and cut her head off. I mean, if this isn't sick, nothing is. To this day, Detective Sylvia has never been able to shake her senseless death. It's always affected me. I mean, it affects me now. Years later, I still think of what could I have done to save that person? You know, what could I have done to encourage her more 
to get into a place where we could give her the protection that she needed. Murphy also indicates to police that Drew killed Doreen Levesque. But after interviewing other members, Sylvia believes that Murphy had a much greater role in the killings. Robin had them all involved. Robin told them, everyone pick up a rock. Hit her. Now you're all murderers. You're all murderers. So anyone opens their mouth, you're going down just like me. Andre Maltese, the man who first tipped police about Barbara Posa's involvement in the sex industry, was ultimately convicted of her murder. He died behind bars. Carl Drew was only convicted of the murder of Karen Marsden and is serving life in prison. To this day, he maintains his innocence. Murphy was given a life sentence for her role in the Marsden murder, but she was paroled in 2004. She deserves much more than the 15 years that she did. Carl's doing a life um, she should be doing the same. She masterminded these homicides. My fear is that Robin will, will kill again. No one was ever prosecuted for the murder of Doreen Levesque. To do something like that, it has to be. It has to be evil. I mean, it's evil at work. Where does evil come from? The devil made him do it. The ringleaders in Fall River used satanic worship as a form of intimidation and to obscure their motives. Satanism gave them ways to punish other people and gave them a license to do it. And the veil of vampirism allowed John Crutchley to justify his sexual sadism. It's the vampire image that gives them a sense of, of the ability to pull it off and um, the idea they might get away with it. Hiding behind the occult was ultimately not enough to shield these predators from justice.